This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the series Millionaire Murders, where people are targeted for murder due to their wealth. Last time, I told the story of how a greedy son took a hit out on his own family in order to inherit their riches. This time, the story is not as clear-cut as to the motive. But the victim was a man of vast wealth, living in a veritable fortress, who may have perished when a person in his employ sought to make a name for himself. This is Chapter 2, Murder in Monaco, Edmund Safra. In lieu of advertisements, I'm asking you this month to support independent podcasts like this one, by sharing them with a friend. You guys made last week my fastest downloaded episode ever and shattered all previous records for daily downloads. I cannot thank you enough. That's the kind of power podcast listeners have. You guys rock. This time, I want to share a short message from another indie podcast that you should check out. Hey there, mixers and hide and seekers. I'm Mixer Hyde, and I am the host of a podcast called In the Mix. Each week, I talk about culture and interview people making that culture, and oftentimes, those people are podcasters. I believe that everyone has a story to tell and a message to share, and I personally intend to hear as many of those as possible. So why don't you join me, and let's discover something. You can find In the Mix on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find his YouTube channel under Mixter Hyde and get his interview with this podcaster. There are links in the show notes. Thanks again for all your support and for supporting independent podcasts. Without you, we'd all just be talking to ourselves. Now, on to the show. Lily Watkins was born in Brazil in 1934. Her father, Wolf White Watkins, was a Russian Jewish immigrant and a native of Czechoslovakia and her mother, Anita Noodleman, was born in Uruguay. Lily married for the first time at age 19. Her husband, Mario Cohen, was an Argentinian millionaire who made his money as the manufacturer of nylon stockings. They had three children together, a daughter, Adriana, and two sons, Eduardo and Claudio. Lily and Cohen divorced in the early 1960s, and she then met a Brazilian named Alfredo Freddy Greenberg. Greenberg later changed his name to Monteverde. Monteverde was also wealthy. He owned a chain of appliance stores in South America. Lily and Monteverde adopted a son together named Carlos. Monteverde committed suicide in 1969. Lily inherited around $230 million from her late husband. She employed her husband's banker, Edmund Safra, the head of Banco Safra in Brazil, to help her invest her assets. Lily and Safra began to date, but it didn't last. By some accounts, Lily's family did not approve of her relationship with him. But there are other accounts that say Edmund's family steered him away from marrying Lily Monteverde. Edmund Safra was born to Jacob and Esther Safra in Beirut, Lebanon in 1932. The Safras were an Arab-Jewish family from Syria. Edmund's father founded the J.E. Safra Bank in Beirut in 1920. By the time he was 16, Edmund was working in his father's bank, engaged in the precious metals and foreign exchange aspects of the banking business. In the 1950s, the Safras moved to Brazil, and with his father, Edmund opened Banco Safra in 1955. In 1956, Safra settled in Geneva to set up the private bank, Trade Development Bank, which he grew from one million to nearly 5 billion U.S. dollars by the 1980s. He also founded the Republic National Bank of New York, operating 80 branches in New York. When Edmund first met Lily, he was in his early 40s and had never married. His brothers, Joseph and Moisa, had urged him to marry and have children so that his business could be passed down to his own children. Safra was afraid that someone would marry him solely for his fortune. But Lily Monteverdi was already wealthy, So with her, he did not have that concern. He'd also fallen madly in love with her. However, his brothers did not approve and warned him away. 
they were suspicious of her husband's suicide, even though it had been investigated twice at the time of his death, and nothing was found to be out of the ordinary. Edmund's brothers also thought Lily was too old to have children with Edmund, and besides that, would bring children of her own into the marriage. They talked Edmund out of asking Lily to marry him, for which, it seems, Lily never forgave them. They went their separate ways, with Lily moving to London and Edmund to New York. Edmund was heartbroken over losing Lily and threw himself into his work, barely leaving the building where his bank was located and where he occupied an apartment on the top floor. Lily, perhaps to get over Edmund, perhaps to make him jealous, married a 35-year-old English businessman, Samuel Bendahan, in a quickie marriage in Acapulco. She separated from him only two months later. Edmund returned to beg Lily to marry him, having decided he couldn't live without her. A year after her marriage to Bendahan, her divorce was final, and she and Safra married in 1976. A friend of theirs described their marriage as the irresistible combination of a lady with a past and a man with a future. Before they married, they both signed a 600-page prenuptial agreement. Some joked that it was more a merger than a marriage. But the Safras truly loved one another. The fact that they were both vastly wealthy just put icing on the cake. And this was wealth at the stratospheric level. They had several exclusive residences they could occupy in any number of cosmopolitan cities, including a luxury penthouse apartment on Fifth Avenue in New York, as well as a spare apartment for guests at the Pierre Hotel. They also owned homes in London, Paris, and Geneva, but their most exclusive residence was La Leopolda, one of the most opulent homes on the French Riviera. And when your house has its own name, you know you've made it. The Villa of La Leopolda was first planned by King Leopold II of Belgium for his mistress. It is located on 18 acres in the French Riviera. After Leopold's death, the mistress was evicted and it became the property of his nephew, King Albert I. In the 1920s, the American architect Ogden Codman Jr. purchased the over one dozen structures on the property to completely redesign the villa to the splendor it currently displays, complete with beautifully landscaped gardens and spectacular views. Later, the villa was purchased by Gianni Agnelli, president of Fiat Motors. The movie To Catch a Thief, starring Cary Grant and Grace Kelly, was filmed at La Leopolda in 1955. In 1963, Dorothy Killam, an American-born Canadian philanthropist, became its owner. She'd inherited $83 million upon the death of her husband, Isaac Walton Killam, in 1955. He had been the president of the brokerage firm Royal Securities. Dorothy Killam set about selling her shares of stock and reinvesting her money, increasing her wealth greatly. For a time, she was known as the richest woman in the world. She collected jewelry and especially loved diamonds. She owned the 90-carat Briolette of India diamond. After her death, famed American jeweler Harry Winston purchased her collection of diamonds and pearls for $4 million. She was a big baseball fan and at one time offered to purchase the Brooklyn Dodgers for $5 million, but her offer was declined. She died at La Leopolda in 1965. Lily and Edmund purchased La Leopolda in the 1980s. They spent a fortune redecorating the rooms in the villa as well as adding a landing pad for their helicopter and quarters for the Mossad-trained bodyguards who were ever-present. In 1988, they held a ball that is still talked about by society elite to this day. It was attended by none other than Prince Rainier and Princess Caroline of Monaco, Princess Ferial of Jordan, Christina Onassis, as well as many of the Rothschilds. I knew these to be very wealthy people since I was a kid, as my dad would always yell, Turn off the light! Who do you think we are, the Rothschilds? Guests raved about the beauty of the villa, as well as the perfectly prepared and presented food and drink, and the generosity and graciousness of their hosts. Each female guest left the party with a custom-made enameled box that bore a portrait of the Villa Leopolda. Lily Safra was a collector of 18th-century French furniture and purchased so much of it that despite her numerous residences, found it necessary to have a warehouse to hold the overflow. It was rumored that the redecoration of her bedroom at La Leopolda cost over $2 million, not including the furniture she already owned. She was generous with her friends. 
She once sent Manolo Blahnik shoes to all of them, having her secretary call to get their sizes. Lily's extravagance earned her the nickname, the Gilded Lily. But the Safras also gave generously to causes and charities. Even though he never attended university himself, Edmund Safra felt encouraging youngsters towards higher education was important. Together, he and Lily founded the International Sephardic Education Foundation. The Edmund J. Safra Foundation supports medical research and humanitarian relief. Edmund gave large amounts to build and refurbish synagogues around the world. He was also a large donor to hospitals in the United States, France, and South America. As luxurious as La Leopolda was, the villa was not a convenient place to live full-time. Instead, they lived in a penthouse apartment 16 kilometers or 10 miles away in Monaco. It would be the scene of a tragic event, of which many questions have still gone unanswered to this day. The Principality of Monaco is a sovereign city-state bordered by France and located on the French Riviera. The total area is about 2 kilometers, or 1.2 miles, with a population of only 38,000. A tax haven for the rich, over 30% of Monaco's population were estimated to be millionaires in 2014. It is also a tourist destination for the rich, with its casinos, yacht harbors, and the annual Monaco Grand Prix, one of the most prestigious automobile races in the world. Monaco is also known as one of the safest places to live in the world. It seems as if almost every square foot is monitored by closed-circuit cameras that are placed in streets, underpasses, lobbies, casinos, and hotels. There is approximately one police officer for every 100 citizens. Safra had always made sure to have plenty of security around himself and his family. He had collaborated with the FBI in the mid-1990s, to expose the Russian Mafia's international money laundering operation, so he was naturally concerned about his personal safety. Edmund and Lily spent millions a year on security for themselves, as well as their children and grandchildren. They had bodyguards armed with machine guns, many of them veterans of the Mossad in Israel. These guards were stationed at all of the Safra's residences, and they worked in shifts around the clock. The apartment in Monaco was no different. Eleven bodyguards were in Safra's employ there. As well, the penthouse apartment that was on top of a building that housed the Republic National Bank had been rebuilt to accommodate surveillance cameras, bulletproof glass, and still shutters on every window. At least one of the bathrooms, the one adjacent to Edmund's room, had been designed as a safe room, a bunker-like fortress that he and his family could escape to in case of an attack. A single event in 1999 would change the trajectory of Theodore Marr's life forever. Marr, a 41-year-old married father of three, had served in the United States Army Special Forces, commonly referred to as the Green Berets. After being discharged from the Army, he began taking college classes, earning his degree and meeting his first wife. His first marriage was brief, but resulted in a son. In 1993, he would wed his second wife, Heidi, a woman he'd been classmates with in college and later reconnected with when they both began working at the same hospital. Ted and Heidi had two more children together. In 1999, Marr had been a registered nurse at the Columbia Medical Center of New York's Presbyterian Hospital for 10 years. He was working in the neonatal unit when one of their patients released from the hospital left a camera behind. Interestingly, instead of turning the camera into a superior or lost and found, he decided to take the film and develop it to see if he could determine who the camera belonged to and return it to them. He recognized from the photos a patient who had recently given birth to twins. Tracking down the address of the couple, Harry and Laura Slatkin, from hospital records, he returned the camera and the photos of their newborn babies to them. Grateful, the couple then inquired about the details of the Good Samaritan's life. Finding out about his background in the military and his nursing credentials, they decided to pass his name along to the Safras. You see, Harry Slatkin is the brother of Howard Slatkin, one of Lily Safra's favorite interior decorators. As well, the Slatkin's good friend, Adriana Elia, was the daughter of Lily Safra by her first husband, Mario Cohen. It was Adriana who thought that Ted Marr might make a wonderful nurse for her stepfather, Edmund Safra. Safra had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease 
and now had nurses to help him with his daily physical needs around the clock. Mar was interviewed for the job and was offered $600 a day, more money than he could ever hope to make as a registered nurse in New York. While he hesitated at first because he would attend to Mr. Safra when he was in New York, but he'd have to leave his wife and children to travel to Monaco when Safra returned home. But he was also aware that the nurses' union he was a member of was about to strike. When that happened, he wouldn't have an income to provide for his family. As well, he just spent over $60,000 to obtain custody of his son by his first marriage. He needed the money, so he agreed to take the job. In the summer of 1999, he left for Monaco. Safra was now 67 years old, and due to the increasing symptoms of his disease, was on the verge of retiring and making Monaco his permanent home. He was also selling his Republic National Bank to HSBC. Wall Street found the sale controversial. They estimated that Safra was selling his bank for 40% below its actual worth. In any case, Safra decided to make the deal. He and Lily would still be walking away with about $3 billion in cash from the sale. By all accounts, Ted and Edmund Safra got along well. Edmund liked his new nurse and was impressed by his Green Beret background. Ted liked Edmund as well, but he was not as thrilled with the other staff members, it was reported. He especially disliked Safra's chief nurse, Sonia Casiano. Ted was not thrilled to be taking orders from the other nurses who had less education, training, and experience than he did, and yet he was the low man on the totem pole. It was reported as well that the staff generally liked Mr. Safra, but were more intimidated by Lily Safra. She was increasingly in charge of the home and the business, they said, as Mr. Safra needed more care. She was a stern taskmaster and was not as warm and engaging as her husband. Lily occupied her own wing of the penthouse, while Edmund's room was located on the other side, near a nursing station that was staffed 24 hours a day. This would have been necessary for Mrs. Safra to have any privacy, and since Mr. Safra had to be administered medication frequently, it may have been to allow her to sleep undisturbed. Ted Marr would later tell an interviewer that in November, just three months after having arrived in Monaco, he was offered a permanent position on the staff. He was excited by this news, as he said, it meant he could now begin making plans to move his family there. Two weeks later, on the night of December 3rd, Marr reported to work at the penthouse as usual. The nurses worked long hours, but he would say, in reality, there wasn't much to do on the overnight shift. The toughest part of the job was staying awake. He'd heard that past nurses had been fired for falling asleep on the job. That seemed to be one of the only areas of stress he encountered. On December 2nd, he was working the overnight shift in tandem with a nurse he liked a lot and would later say was like a mother figure to him, 52-year-old Vivian Torrente. They took turns administering Mr. Safra's medication and sitting by his bedside as he slept. The nursing station was located on the top floor of the penthouse. Next to it was a large exercise room that led into Mr. Safra's bedroom. Through another door was a large bathroom and dressing room. The following is what happened, according to Ted Marr, in the early morning hours of December 3, 1999. At about 4.30 a.m., Vivian was in the bedroom watching over Mr. Safra while Ted was in the nursing station. He was trying not to fall asleep, so he decided to go into the exercise room and grab a small barbell weight that he brought back to the nursing station. He began to do curls with the weight while sitting at the desk in the nursing station when he was attacked from behind. He was hit on the head and went down, he said. Automatically reverting to his Green Beret training, he jumped up. He was dazed, but saw two masked men in the room. He sprang into action using the weight he still had in his hand to knock one of them to the floor. The second man then pulled out a knife. He was grabbed by the leg and was struggling to get away when he was slashed on the left calf with the knife. He turned away and was then cut on his right side. Still trying to get away, he turned once again and was stabbed in his abdomen. He then went unconscious. When he came to, in what he believes was only a few minutes, the men were both gone. He rushed to the bedroom and told Vivian that the apartment had been broken into. He told her to take Mr. Safra into the bathroom as it was equipped with steel reinforced doors for just such an emergency. Ironically, the Safras felt so safe at the Monaco apartment 
that they didn't keep their bodyguards with them like they did at all their other residences. The security staff, including the head of security, stayed at the villa, 16 kilometers away. Mar gave Vivian his cell phone to call for help. He told her he was going to get medical help for himself. Otherwise, I was going to die, he told an interviewer later. He stumbled, bleeding, down to the bank lobby, where the security guard called for help. Within minutes, an ambulance was called, and Mar was on his way to Princess Grace Hospital. At that point, he says, he felt everything was going to be fine. But everything was not fine. The timeline of the rest of the events could not be more strange or tragic. Because when Ted Marr told the events of that night, he left out one major detail. Before stumbling down to the lobby, he decided to try and set an alarm to summon help. Although the penthouse was like a fortress, there were no alarms. The only alarm he could think of was the smoke alarm. So using a candle, he placed some Kleenex in a wastebasket and set it on fire. He then set it under the smoke alarm in the nurse's station so that the smoke from the fire would trip the alarm. The rest of the events of that day are on record. At 4.49 a.m., the monitoring station detected a fire alarm from the Safra's apartment. At 5 a.m., Vivian Torrente used the cell phone Mar gave her to call head nurse Sonia Casiano from Safra's dressing room and told her to call police. She informed her that Mar had been attacked and injured. Torrente would make five more calls in the next 90 minutes. The first police officers arrived to conduct a floor-by-floor search at 5.12 a.m. At 5.20 a.m., Mar was transported to the hospital by ambulance. At 5.24, people nearby began calling the fire department to notify them of smoke coming from the building. At 5.30, Torrente made her fourth phone call from the cell phone. She did not mention smoke. Safra sounded calm, but requested the police. At approximately 6 a.m., Lily Safra is rescued from her bedroom through a window. At 6.15, firefighters arrive and begin battling the blaze that has now begun to engulf the apartment. At 6.30, Torrente makes her last call from the cell phone. She is losing consciousness, and Safra can be heard coughing in the background. At 7.45 a.m., firefighters gain access to the locked bathroom and discover the bodies of Safra and Torrente. They had died of carbon monoxide poisoning. The smoke was able to permeate the room through the fire detection system. Their bodies were blackened by the soot. By that timeline, you can see that it took over two hours for firefighters to reach Mr. Safra and Ms. Torrente. What was the holdup? First of all, firefighters were on the scene quickly, but police had a report of armed intruders, and they took that to mean terrorists. Police refused to allow firefighters access to the building until they could determine if there was still a threat from the attackers. Police and firefighters would say that they were thwarted in their ability to access the fire to put it out by the very security measures Safra had put into place to keep him safe, bulletproof glass and metal shutters over all the windows. Lily Safra called her head of security to bring the key to the bathroom where her husband was locked inside. There were some reports that Safra, fearing assassins, refused to come out of the bathroom. Staff said that the numerous medications he was taking for his disease were making him increasingly paranoid, and he was also, understandably, terrified after hearing that his nurse had been stabbed by intruders. Instead, he and Torrente put wet rags underneath the door to try and reduce the smoke and waited to be rescued. Some reports state that Lily even spoke to her husband during one of the cell phone calls to let him know the coast was clear and he could come out, but he did not respond. However, when the head of security arrived, he was not only not allowed into the home, but was put in handcuffs by police until they determined who he was and what he was doing there, wasting precious time. In the end, Edmund Safra and poor Vivian Torrente both perished in the fire that Mar said he'd set as a way to rescue them. Police were suspicious and began questioning him about his story. No intruders were ever found. No other witnesses reported seeing anyone there that morning who was not on staff or residents. The security cameras caught no sign of intruders either inside or outside of the apartment. 
Things were beginning to smell more fishy by the minute. Marr was interrogated, and three days later, authorities made the following announcement. Ted Marr, the male nurse from Stormville, New York, had confessed to setting the blaze that killed his employer in order to win favor with him. Marr had started the fire in the wastebasket in order to call attention to himself and become a hero. He was threatened with losing his job, the prosecutor said, because the head nurse did not like him and was making his job more difficult. He had made mistakes on the job due to her lack of direction and was worried he'd lose his $200,000 a year job, so he decided to prove himself a valuable employee that the Saffers would never fire. He wanted to be a hero, the prosecutor said. There were no hooded intruders, and the stab wounds in Mar's abdomen and thigh were self-inflicted. He also stated that Mar, at the time of the fire, was highly agitated, psychologically fragile, and under the influence of medication. As soon as the banking community heard about the armed intruders and Safra's death, tongues began to wag about his various enemies. Some said that the Russian mafia was involved, since Safra had helped the FBI in their investigation into their operation. Others said it must be Palestinian terrorists. Other rumors were that Safra had laundered money for Colombian drug cartels and that his bank and private jet had been used to move money and personnel during the Iran-Contra scandal. All of these stories were eventually debunked. Marr was represented by a well-respected American lawyer, Michael Griffith, who had volunteered to help in his defense. Griffith specialized in defending clients who were facing charges in foreign countries. He had previously represented Billy Hayes, an American whose escape from a Turkish jail had inspired the movie Midnight Express. Griffith did not deny that Meyer had set the fire that had ultimately killed his employer and co-worker, but defended him by saying it was not deliberate, but it was a stupid, most insane thing a human being could do, he told the court. Geez, good thing Meyer wasn't paying for this defense. However, he did not mean to kill Safra, he explained. He just wanted Mr. Safra to appreciate him more. He loved Mr. Safra. Marr would continue to say that the deaths could have been avoided had the police allowed the firefighters to quickly do their job. In December 2002, Ted Marr was convicted of the arson deaths of both Edmund Safra and Vivian Torrente and sentenced to 10 years in prison. But this is far from the end of this story. There were some claims that Marr was just the fall guy. Some would continue to believe that there was a conspiracy to kill Safra, and Marr was just the unwitting stooge. Marr would later claim that his confession was coerced. But there would still be many questions about his story. And I have a few as well. But more about that and my thoughts later. Marr's wife Heidi said she'd been called the day of the fire and was informed about the attack. She was told her husband had been taken by ambulance to the hospital. She had already heard news reports that Safra and a nurse had died, and she had assumed the worst, that it was her husband who was killed in the fire. So she was relieved upon receiving this call. The employment service that had originally placed Head in his position with the Safras paid for her airfare and for a car and driver to get her to Monte Carlo. Her brother accompanied her, and his airfare was also covered. Heidi said she was told her husband was a hero who had been attacked trying to save Mr. Safra. But by the time she had arrived in Monaco, Ted had been arrested and was at the police station. Heidi said she later found out that her return plane ticket had been canceled. She said her passport was taken from her by police, and she was then interrogated for three days before she was allowed to see her husband. She'd left her children in the U.S. to come to Monaco, and now she and Ted claimed they were threatened that she would not be able to leave the country unless Marr signed a confession. Even though he and his lawyers would admit that he faked the attack and started the fire, Marr now says his confession was forced, and the document he signed admitting to the crime was written in French, a language he does not read or speak. Authorities in Monaco say that Ted always had access to an English translator. His own lawyers also said they never told him to lie in court. Not only did he sign the confession after giving the same account that was written in the statement several times, but he even walked police through his actions of that fateful day, going back to the penthouse to recreate the series of events for investigators. But Marr now says prosecutors and his own attorney told him to sign the confession because if he didn't, 
He was going to be condemned anyway and would probably be given a long sentence and might never see his family again. So he says he agreed to confess and was given 10 years. Instead of serving out his 10 years, however, Marr decided to try and escape. He said he did it because he felt unjustly convicted. In any case, only two months after he was sentenced, he and his cellmate, a man awaiting trial on a robbery charge, sawed through their cell bars and, using garbage bags tied together to make a rope, made a dash for freedom. Marr was able to make it 15 miles, or 24 kilometers, to Nice. From a hotel, he made phone calls to his wife, his lawyer, and a priest. He was captured seven hours later, and 10 months was added on to his sentence. I've seen this before in other cases when a prisoner escapes and then is recaptured. They are given an additional six months, eight months, or 10 months or so. It makes me wonder, why don't more prisoners try to escape? It kind of seems worth the risk, if that's all you're going to get for the attempt. Okay, I shouldn't have said that. Scratch that. What I meant to say was, shouldn't prisoners get more time, like additional years added on for attempting a prison break? Just my opinion. Marr was returned to prison and then was released in 2007. He spent a total of eight years behind bars, three before and during the trial, and five after his conviction. He returned to the United States and his family. He began speaking to various news outlets after his release, stating his innocence and insisting that his confession was coerced. In 2008, he sat for an interview with Sarah James of Dateline NBC, and this time he added a new twist to the story. He repeated the story of the intruders who had attacked him as he had the barbell weight in his hand at the nursing station. He went unconscious, and when he came to, warned Vivian and Mr. Safra to secure themselves inside the bathroom. He lit the fire to set off a smoke alarm to summon help before heading down to the lobby to seek medical help for his stab wounds. Three hours later, his boss and Vivian were dead. He could not believe the news when he heard this, he said. He now said he'd lied when he'd said he'd made up the attack and the masked intruders in order to become invaluable to Mr. Safra. That was all BS. It really did happen, he now told Dateline. And not only that, he'd been kidnapped a few days before the attack by perhaps the same men. Two days before the attack, Mars says he was walking on a street in nearby Nice on his day off when a man stepped in front of him. A van pulled up alongside him at the same time. He was then pushed into the van. The abductors were wearing masks, had a gun, and spoke with, quote, thick Mediterranean accents, Mars says. I was told some very specific things, and I said, I don't know what this is all about, but I'm not going to do anything to hurt anyone. He was then told they only wanted him to do one thing, leave one of the window shutters open near the nursing station. He says he responded, I'm not going to do anything to endanger anyone. He then says his abductors showed him pictures of his family. He said it was obvious that they had been watching his wife and children and had taken the photos without their knowledge. He said he now became terrified for their safety. He said the window shutter he'd been told to keep open was already ajar when he went to work the next night. He said he believed the attackers had entered through that window. Oh my gosh, so many questions. None of this makes any friggin' sense. Okay, let's go through his story, shall we? Why would potential assassins approach an ex-Green Beret and threaten him, but only ask him to open a window? I mean, if that was even something assassins would do, not... Wouldn't they approach someone who would be much less of a threat, say any of the numerous older female nurses on staff? You might think, well, he was the new guy, so maybe they thought he might go along with it. But if they could threaten his family, couldn't they do that to any one of the employees? Second, why wouldn't he just report this incident to the head of Safra's security and put him on alert? As a matter of fact, at the same time, ask them to send a detail to his home in New York to keep his family safe. Or tell the Safras, I'm out of here, and fly home to protect them yourself? I mean, ex-Green Beret? Wouldn't that be your automatic response with that kind of training? Okay, so assassins need Mars assistance to get to their target, so they warn him that they are coming to attack. Right, because that's what you do. And they are only armed with knives, really? What kind of assassins are these? I mean, he said they had a gun on him in the van. What do they do? Forget it at home? Ridiculous. And when they do attack, 
They don't even use the knife at first. He says he was hit over the head, and they only stabbed him after he began to try and fight them off. And the biggest question, and the first one that came to my mind when I read his initial statement about the attack, where did they go after they subdued him? He came to, and they were gone. Again, what kind of cut-rate assassins are these that they don't finish the job? When he came to, he says, Edmund Safra was still asleep in his room, close by, I may add, and being watched over by Vivian Torrente. Not only was this a very silent attack that Vivian was not alerted to at all, but they then, what, left through the window without killing or attacking or kidnapping Safra? What the heck did they come there for? Decorating ideas? Sarah James asked him some of these questions when she interviewed him for Dateline. He just said he didn't know. He didn't have answers to those questions. She also asked instead of starting a fire to set off a fire alarm, why didn't he just call the police? He had a cell phone with him, the one he'd given to Vivian Torrente to use. Why didn't he just dial Monaco's equivalent of whatever 911 was? The question he stammered out? Didn't have a clue. Never prepared. Didn't have a clue. Never even thought about it. Really? You're a $200,000 per year hired nurse to a very ill man, and you don't know how to call for emergency services? Kind of hard to believe, much like the rest of his story. And she asked one other question that I thought was interesting. He told this long, drawn-out story earlier about how he had to try to force himself to stay awake on overnight shifts. That was why he had gone to get the weight from the exercise room, to give himself something to do so he wouldn't accidentally fall asleep. Why, she asked, would he be in danger of falling asleep when he was warned that something big was going to happen that night? I mean, she asked, that's not a typical night. You're not going to have any trouble falling asleep that night. You're going to be on pins and needles. Yes, you're right, he answers, and I was, I mean, but after 36 hours on without any sleep at all and being under that stress, by 4.30 in the morning, I was exhausted. That's the end of her questions to him about that. But I'll remind you of something, dear listeners. Mar had reported for duty that previous day, and the fire happened early the following morning. But when he was supposedly accosted in Nice, it was his day off. So how is he up for 36 hours? The math doesn't work out, so this must be another lie. Mar also tries to say that there was no motive for him to want to lie about the attack. The theory that he was trying to be a hero to save his job doesn't make sense, he says. He told Dateline that just the week prior to the fire, he had completed his probationary period and had been made a permanent staff member. I did not find any statements from the Safra staff or Lily Safra to corroborate this, however. But as I look back on his background, the unfolding of events, and also some of the statements Marr has made since, I can see how trying to be a hero would fit a pattern of behavior for him. First of all, Marr enlisted in the Army with the goal of becoming a Green Beret. A soldier must meet certain requirements to even be considered for this elite organization, including a battery of physical, mental, and technical tests, as well as to be eligible for a secret security clearance. In other words, you have to stand out from the pack to become a Green Beret. Perhaps his need to be considered special or set apart started here, or perhaps he already had this need before and that's why he wanted to become a member of the Special Forces. Second, the whole story about how he came to be considered for a job on staff with the Safras is telling as well. Having found the camera left behind at the hospital, he took it upon himself to investigate and try to find out who it belonged to. Then once he did, he personally delivered the camera and photos back to the couple. He had to know they would be very impressed with him and grateful to receive the very first pictures of their newborn twins, pictures they probably thought were lost forever. Which brings up another question. I'm pretty sure the couple would have called the hospital to inquire if anyone had found their camera in the maternity ward. If he'd simply reported it and left it at the nursing station lost and found, they probably would have retrieved it right away and wouldn't have had to spend an extra week or whatever believing those photos were gone. In any case, here is Mar again, seeking out special recognition. Did he do a good deed? Sure. But I think many other people may have done the same, without having to go to all that trouble Mar did to make sure that they knew he was responsible for their good fortune. Then there was the reported issue he had with the head nurse in charge of the Safras. He didn't like her at all, 
and it was said that he felt other staff members were beneath him in skills and education. In other words, he didn't like taking orders from people he thought were not as skilled, special, or deserving as he was. Some of the statements he made in interviews jumped out at me as I was considering this need he had for recognition. Here are some examples. When telling Dateline about his wife and children, he makes it a point to tell the interviewer that he, quote, personally delivered his two young children. When he was offered the job on the Safra staff, he's asked if he felt lucky. He answers, I felt blessed. I mean, it wasn't a matter of being lucky. It was almost like a blessing. You can unpack that statement to read, luck is something you get that you don't deserve. A blessing is like a reward. And of course, one he probably thought he deserved. I mean, he'd spent nine years working in the intensive care neonatal unit of the hospital. This is a place where life and death decisions are made to help the most fragile human beings survive, premature and ill newborn babies. That's got to make you feel important. Don't get me wrong, it's a wonderful thing. It's God's work, really. But I just wonder if part of Mars' motive for being there was that, again, it made him feel special and set apart from other nurses. Then he becomes part of Edmund Safra's world. About this experience, he says, every place that I ever visited, his banks, his offices, were beyond your wildest dreams. I just wonder if being around all that splendor and opulence and wealth made him think, now I've made it. This is where I belong. Finally, I also found in the record, after doing a little more digging, some details about Ted Mars' history and his personality. The fact that he was a life-saving nurse, that he'd served in the Special Forces in the Army, and that he was a family man could be found in the headlines. But Time Magazine did a bit more research into his life and questioned some of the people who knew him earlier in his life and came up with some surprising, or perhaps not so surprising, stories. They interviewed his co-workers at New York Presbyterian Hospital, who all said he was a very skilled, caring, and professional nurse. No problems there but they also talked to a former landlord of Mars who described him as aggressive and threatening. He went as far as to say that when he had to approach his former tenant, he made sure that there was a door between them. A 70-year-old man who was a neighbor of the Mars in upstate New York also described him as hostile and violent. He was a miserable bastard, the neighbor told reporters. He said Mar turned a property line disagreement into a blood feud. He said Mar and his wife Heidi would stand outside of his home, screaming and cursing at him and giving him the finger. He said Mar actually assaulted him, throwing him to the ground and threatening to shoot him. His former wife also alleged spousal abuse as well as drug use by Mar. He had threatened to kill her, she reported, and he liked to play Russian roulette, with whom was not specified. Prosecutors had also reported that Mar was a drug user, saying that he was a heavy user of sedatives. After interviewing Lily Safra and the staff, they said that none of these details about Mar had come out during his background check for the job. However, prosecutors would say that Mar himself brought his own file with him, including his army and employment records, as well as character references, when he met with Lily Safra. So, the idea that Ted Mar would have faked a terrorist attack and then try to get credit for saving his life fits into this pattern of needing to feel special and to be recognized. I don't believe that he meant for Mr. Safra or anyone to die. When he called the fire a terrible accident, I think he meant it. He never thought the fire would get out of control and believed that it would be extinguished almost as soon as he was taken away by ambulance. But an unfortunate and tragic series of events kept Edmund Safra and Vivian Torrente from being saved. It was Mars' lies and actions that caused these series of events to happen at all. And that is why he was convicted of their deaths. Ted's wife Heidi stood by him during the trial and steadfastly maintained that he was innocent. However, she divorced him in 2006, one year before he was released from prison. She was given full custody of the children. The penthouse was rebuilt, but Lily Safra moved to London and away from the terrible memories of the last night of her husband's life. Genevieve Torrente, Vivian Torrente's daughter, is trying to put the memory of the terrible fire her mother perished in behind her. She believes that justice was done, that Ted Marr was accidentally responsible for the tragedy. 
But you know, she says, in the back of my head, I always kind of felt that it's not the end of the story. It's not what really happened. Part of me thinks that I'll never find out what happened. Edmund Safra was buried in Geneva, Switzerland. His funeral was attended by some of the most important people in high society, banking, and politics, including the fashion designer Hubert de Givenchy, former UN Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuellar, and Prince Sadrudin Aga Khan. Nobel Prize winner Elie Wiesel gave one of the eulogies. Lily Safra did not allow her brothers-in-law to attend Edmund's funeral. The bad blood between them had existed since they talked their brother out of marrying her the first time. Joseph and Moisa blamed Lily that they had not remained close to their brother. They claimed that his wife kept him isolated after his illness began, and calls they made were not forwarded to Edmund. They were also angry with his widow that he was not buried in their family burial plot in Israel. They also reported that by the time they arrived in Monaco, Edmund's casket had been sealed, and they were unable to see their brother one last time. Safra left 50% of his assets to charities, with the bulk of his estate going to Lily. She received $3 billion from the sale of the bank, as well as somewhere between $500 to $800 million from Edmund's estate. She is now one of the richest women in the world, with a net worth of about $1.2 billion. She gives millions to charity, including the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. She oversaw the completion of the Edmund J. Safra Synagogue in Manhattan. In 2005, she auctioned off furniture and art from her collection. She donated $3 million from the proceeds to charities and causes, including a large donation to Dillard University in New Orleans to help them rebuild after Hurricane Katrina. In 2009, she donated $1 million to the Elton John's AIDS Foundation, $5 million to the One Laptop Per Child Foundation, and $16 million to the Edmund and Lily Safra Children's Hospital in Israel. She is now 82 years old and has never remarried. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Join us next week for another chapter of Millionaire Murders. And don't forget to share the podcast with one person this month. Thanks. I want to give a few thank yous for podcast reviews. Thanks this time from iTunes reviews. Go to Pod Fanatic in the UK, Teng Un Hermana in Sweden, Suave Cav One in Canada, Melon Chad in Australia, and DM2160 in the US. From Stitcher, thanks go to Green Beans. And did you know you can review the podcast on the Facebook page? These people did. Thanks to Vernetta and Dave Wolfman. If you just heard your name, send me a message by email, Facebook, or Twitter with your address, and I'll get a sticker pack out to you. Thanks again. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. You can follow me on Twitter at Upon a Crime and on Facebook and Instagram at Once Upon a Crime Pod. Become a patron for free merchandise, bonus episodes, and more at patreon.com slash once upon a crime. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>